Hello everyone, I'm Daniel, owner and general manager of North Star Radio. I've been receiving some emails from you listeners asking me, who's this Mark Mercer guy you have on the radio? Well, I'll tell you. He's a friend of mine from America who I've known for a few years, and he has this show called Mark Mercer's Loving, Caring and Sharing, or LCS as he likes to call it. And every Friday night at 8pm Eastern Standard Time, that's Saturday morning 1am Greenwich Mean Time, he hosts his show exclusively here on North Star Radio. To give you a bit of an idea about this bloke, I've asked him to give me a segment from one of his archive shows to play for you, so that you may get some idea of what to expect when you tune into his programme. In this segment, Mark describes his trip home from living in Anchorage, Alaska, all the way back in 1980. You know, you shared the story with me about coming from Alaska, which was rather humorous. I don't know how much of that story you'd like to share, but... You know, I, I haven't actually shared that. I, I, you, know, there's, you know what it is? It's like I've got a slew of stories. I just shared one about, uh, about my shampooing experiences on Saturday with everybody. And oh, I think you ought to share the airplane experience for sure. Yeah, all right. You want me to do that now? Is that what you're saying? Are you yeah, playing? bring it on. All right. Well, okay. Uh, bear with me, guys. Uh, this goes back to 1980. I was coming home from Alaska. Uh, a little premature. I wasn't planning on it, but um, uh, I'd burned the wrong guy, and uh, he was he he was going to kill me. So I had to come home. I had to get out of Dodge. So I left. And uh, my friends uh, helped me out. They got me ready for the plane trip, and uh, we had a little going away party for me. And before I got on the plane in, at Anchorage uh, International. Uh, Barbara, my, my roommate, handed me a rather large plate of brownies. And she said, here, these are for the ride home. I was like, wow, cool, man. I'll have munchies for the, for the flight. You know, it was like, a, it was like I, I think I had hit three hubs before I made it to Philly. I had to go to uh, Seattle, and then like Chicago, Pittsburgh, and then, and then Philly. And I, the flight was late at night. It was like 10 o'clock I left. So got on the plane. Everybody saw me off. And uh, you, know, you had a picture of me back then. I had really long hair. I was wearing... A white pair of painter's pants, white sneakers. I had a white shirt on, a white jacket, and a white scarf. And I, I looked like some sort of, I looked like a hippie. I looked like a whacked out nut. And uh, I get, they let me on the plane. They seated me, and I sat in the very rear of the plane. It was one of those flights where you couldn't understand the, um, the financial gain in it because it was me and maybe 20 or 30 people tops. There couldn't have been that many people. It was a 727. It was a lot of room. And I sat all the way in the back in the tail. Because my dad said, if you crash in a plane, you want to be in the tail because they can at least find your parts. Anyway, um, so I sat in the back of the plane and uh, put on the headset. I had a little tiny cassette player. I was listening to Steely Dan Asia, which really mesmerized by the album. And I remember, uh, I guess it was around 1 o'clock in the morning, I pulled out the brownies and I started eating them. And I had a brownie and the, uh, wait, the uh, uh, stewardess came back and she's like, you're all right, you need a pillow or anything? I said, no, nah. I'm munching down this brownie. And she goes, oh, those look good. And I was like, yeah, they're, del I, they're delicious. And she goes, she, she indicated she wanted one. She wanted one? She was, yeah, sure. So she kind of sat down beside me, and she was like a real looker, and I just couldn't help myself but want to have some company, you know, especially a pretty girl, you know. And we're eating brownies, and uh, she's like, hey, you want some milk with these? I go, yeah. So she goes up front, comes back a minute or two later, and um, she pours us milk, and we're drinking milk and eating brownies. She goes, these are really good. I go, ah, oh, yeah. They're, my roommate made them for me before I left. And she goes, they're so chewy and good. She goes, would you, would you mind if I shared them with the other stewards? And I said, yeah, go ahead. So she takes the whole plate and goes, goes off. She's gone for a while. I'm listening to my music, and I'm like, yeah, man, this is great. I'm digging this flight. Now, we'd, we'd left the um, Seattle hub by this time, and we're on our way to Chicago. And we're, you know, we're, you know whatever, 28,000 feet, 30,000, I don't know, cruising. And uh, she comes back, I don't know, 20 minutes later, and there's like three brownies left. And that was a big plate of brownies. And I'm like, oh, oh cool, you know. And uh, she's like, you don't mind if I share them? I said, no, no, that's cool. And uh, I'm not going to eat all of them, you know. I don't know. It was a little later on. She comes back, and she, like, um, kind of leans over, and she's like, uh, Mark, um, was there anything in those brownies? I said, what do you mean? There's chocolate brownies. Fudge, I think. And she's like, no, I mean, like, was there, like, anything in them? I, and I look at her eyes, and they're bloodshot. And I'm thinking, what the heck? And all of a sudden, I realize, I suddenly realize I'm wasted. Now, I had smoked a couple doobies before I left, so I was already buzzing. But all of a sudden, I realized I had that tingling going on in my fingertips and my toes. And I was like, oh, crap. And um, 
I go, well, well, well why? I mean, she goes, well, I, sh I shared these brownies with everybody in the cockpit, the oh, pilot, no. the co-pilot, and the navigator all eating these brownies, and I need to know, did any, was there any, I said, no, no, there's, there's, no, no, I wouldn't do, no, and I'm in total denial here, right, about the whole thing, uh, so she walks back up to the front of the plane, and then it's like, uh, I don't know, maybe an hour goes by, or something like that, I forget, but I remember, uh, she, she came back a little later, and was like, uh, really flying, I mean, she was just giggling, and, uh, and I'm like, uh, she came back to talk to me, and I said, I said, everybody okay? She goes, no. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, the uh, co-pilot's passed out, and the pilot says he doesn't think he can fly the jet anymore. I said, what? She said, I said, what? what? You're, you're kidding me. She goes, no, I'm dead serious. We're actually talking to uh, uh, the uh, tower in Chicago, and, and uh, they're uh, trying to get the navigator to reposition himself in the co-pilot seat to take the wheel because the pilot says that he doesn't feel right and he doesn't know if he can make the landing. And I'm like, oh my God, what have I gotten us into? And uh, and I'm thinking all the time, I'm thinking these were just some brownies Barbara made me. I mean, I didn't. Later on, I found out that she put a double batch of hash in. Oh, I had no idea. No. Uh, it was a present for me. She didn't share them. She thought I'd eat them for the next week. You know, I she had no idea. Anyway, um, we get to. Uh, or approach at O'Hare, and you know, normally what happens is when you come into approach, especially at night, uh, they, they, they flicker on the lights so that people can wake up, you know, and uh, let them know they're going to land. And, um, you know, the pilot always comes on and does that whole thing. Uh, we'll, be a, we'll be landing in uh, Chicago in another 20 minutes, and I just want to tell everybody they want to put your uh, seatbelts on. You know, they usually do that kind of thing. This guy doesn't turn the lights on. He just comes on the speaker, and he don't even <laughs> sound right. And he says... Uh, uh, we'll be landing a couple of minutes. Please, please put your uh, seatbelts on. That's it. That's all we heard. And nobody heard them. They're all asleep. Everybody's out. And I'm thinking, great. Now what's going to happen? So we start doing our come down, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, I've never been much of a praying man, but I'm going to try it out, you know. And uh, so uh, we get uh, we get down. I can start seeing the buildings. I can see Chicago. You know, I could see this. Uh, uh, I could see this, uh, not not the skyline, but I could see a whole lot of buildings. I knew we were coming up on the airport at, at O'Hare. And uh, we finally get down. We're almost to landing. And, uh, you know, I'm, now I'm holding my breath. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And uh, then any of you who have ever flown, you know that typically what happens is when you land, your rear wheels touch down, and then the nose comes down, and then they, they hit the brakes, and then you start slowing down, and everything starts rumbling. Well, our rear wheels hit the ground. And then about five seconds later, we go up in the air again. And I'm like, oh, uh, this is good. And then he comes down, and hit, and now everybody's waking up. Everybody who's sleeping is waking up because they feel this jolt. They hit, you know, you hit the ground, it wakes you right up. And then we're back up in the air, and they're like, what the hell? And all of a sudden, we come back down, we hit again, and this time the nose comes down, and he did what's, what's called, uh, in aviation speak, he did what's called a max effort stop, where they basically reversed it. Yeah, they reverse the engines and nail the brakes, and you come to a scream and halt. And this isn't like you stop and you're leaning forward. Like, anything that's loose goes flying. And all of a sudden, everything's crashing, and people are like, oh, my God! This, you know, and I'm like, oh, shit! And, uh, you know, what, we, what have I done? So, um, you know, we come to a stop, and then, like, you know, we're sitting there on the tarmac for a minute, and, uh, and then finally the, we start moving again, and uh, we got over to the, uh, what do you call uh, the terminal, and uh, the pilot briefly says something like, thank you for flying there, Allied, you know, and that's it. And like, it's wrong. People are like, what was that all about? Did, did you guys feel that? Yeah, I heard the people talking. You know, we get outside, we go up to the, uh, the what do you call it, the top of the ramp where, uh, you know, the check-in spot, and uh, they have one of those, um, what do they call them, the, the, the luggage carriers, you know, the big metal thing with the wheels on it and the rack around it, you put all your suitcases in pilot and the co-pilot are like <laughs> laying in the thing, leaning against each other out cold. And the stewardesses, all, all four of them, are pushing them away. And here comes around the corner a brand new, fresh new crew. These guys were supposed to fly all the way to Philly, and uh, apparently they weren't going to make the trip. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, great. Mark's a terrorist. These guys are going to get they're <laughs> big trouble. And uh, nothing, nothing came of it. We all got back on the plane about an hour later, and we, we departed. We went to... Uh, 
uh, Pittsburgh, uh, stopped there. We were there for just a little while, and then we left, got to Philly, and I got up the plane. I, I, I was now this. You know, any of you have ever taken narcotics, no, you know, like pot? Yeah. You know that you get paranoid and stuff. And I'm now I'm shaking. I'm so nervous. And I finally my, I get off the plane in Philly, and my dad, and my brother, are there to meet me, and I'm like, they're like, how was the flight? And I go, oh, fine. You know, <laughs> I'm stoned out of my mind. My eyes are, you know, beet red. And I uh, got home, and it was like really late in the morning, and. Um, I called up Barbara uh, the next, like that morning, because uh, I wanted to hear it from her. And she answers the phone, and I go, Barb, it's Mark. And she just starts laughing. She's hysterical laughing. And, and I'm like, Barbara, stop. What, what was in the brownies? And she's just giggling, giggling. I said, because I gave them to the crew on the plane. And she's like, oh, my God. I'm supposed to give him that he wanted. I made a double batch of hash for you. What were you thinking? I said, I had no idea you didn't tell me. What am I so I was pretty kind of, you know, freaked out about that. Needless to say, about nine months later, hit rock bottom, ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and been sober from that day to this. And that, my friends, is the story of hash in flight. Mark, that was the most awesome story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Well, thanks. I'll tell you, wasn't that awesome when we were on the plane coming down at Chicago? Hopefully, they didn't have drug nice. testing. A lot of stuff I forget. Yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a fun Especially those of us living in Chicago at the time, Mark. Thanks Thomas. a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, the town drunks here. Hold on, I gotta get them in Hello, here. Hello, my dear. Oh, Martin. How get that are Canuck you, up my here. Dear. All right. Hello. How's it going? Hey. Hello. I'm okay. How you doing, man? Um, hey, I'm frozen. Who's, who's happening? You're frozen. Why are you frozen? I'm not outside. I'm eating ice cream, and it's cold outside. Uh, only in Canada. Only in Canada. Good thinking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Only in Canada. Eat ice cream. Yeah. Snow. Are you in the basement again? <laughs> Hiding from your women? Can aren't you? I knew it. This guy's always hiding. This guy. This guy. 